Well, the story of Jacob's ladder opens quite a field of inquiry. We can't really hope to cover all the aspects of it, but we want to bring out a few of the points which have a bearing, perhaps, upon our own futures. The ancients had one up on us. They recognized that there was something we didn't see, and that the visible universe is only a manifestation of something infinitely greater. Now, in the ancient world, we find a gradual development of a law of analogy. As above, so below. As in the sky, so in the body of man. As it is in the universe, so it is in the strings of a violin. The colors, the elements, everything we know are in orderly sequences. It suddenly became obvious, to some at least, that the universe was a great being and that man was a miniature universe. The latter, of course, is one of the most ancient symbols that we find in the religions of the world. All things follow one immense pattern. It has always been held in mysticism that the human being was a miniature of life, that anyone who could completely solve man could solve all other things. There has been this recognition uh, that the solar system the human body and space itself are identical in law, identical in principles, differing only in magnitudes. The earth was placed in the center, and around the earth in rings uh, were the orbits of the seven planets of that time. It, continue, it began on the face of the earth, and the, a line, a ladder, ascended from the surface of the earth to the extremity of the solar system, which to these people was the planet of, of Saturn. Above Saturn, they had the Empyreum, the world of the heavenly realms and regions, the abodes of deity. Therefore, there were these seven rings, concentric circles, ascending in order from the face of the earth through the orbits of the moon, and then Mercury, then Venus, then the sun, then Mars, then Jupiter, and finally Saturn. The disciple ascended the ladder by overcoming the negative attributes of each of the seven planets. He learned how to use knowledge and not abuse it. He learned to understand the difference between love and lust. He sought so sought to understand the difference between education and knowledge. The psychological universe lying behind the literal one. I think in the problem of television, we have a lesson that we might give a lot of thought to these days. Man is a thinking creature. He should not be brought up by a trainer like a dog. He should not be taught only to obey. He should not be fed because he obeys. He should not have a life of luxury, perhaps, because he happens to obey a rich person. The actual problem is that the human being has a mind that was given to him to think with. It was an active organ, an organ to do something. Most people in various fields of activity never participate in those practices and policies which stretch the mental power and make it do things that we want it to do. In the modern world, we train the mind by education to give us a profession or a trade, or a craft, or membership in a union, or whatever it may be. We listen to the instruction, we get the job, we stay with the job, and in all this procedure we have done very little thinking. We have followed policy, we have obeyed rules, we have done what the boss told us to, and we may have taken a few special courses in computerization or something of that nature. But the real creative faculties of the mind have not been used at all. So at the end of one of these harrowing days, we go home, sit down, and sit down in front of the television, and perhaps spend anywhere from two to six hours watching what? We're not watching anything that was going to make us really think a good deal. If it's an educational program, it will be turned off very quickly. We watch sports, we listen to the news, which is usually highly influenced politically. We go through a few horror dramas, westerns, few very poor humor programs, 
and then settle down to the great run of family ethics in which uh, we learn nothing but may choose one or two characters to pull for because they seem to create sympathy and one or two whom we love to hate because we don't like them. Now this constitutes a big intellectual experience and by the time we have finished with that we are so exhausted we fall into bed. In the daytime we have all kinds of domestic programs, programs which may or may not bear upon any factual situation. We may have a few instructive ones on non-commercial programming, but we listen, we watch, and that just go out and get a cold beer or something of this nature. Nothing happens upstairs in ourselves. Nothing is being developed as a factor in the growth of our own thinking. We are not thinking and if we are thinking, we are not doing anything about it because most of the thoughts are non-factual. So here we go all through an entire lifetime, surrounded by all types of information, which we accept only through the eyes and ears. And when the time comes, we do very little to solve our own problems. If we get sick, we go to a doctor, and maybe we will do what he recommends, and if we do not like what he recommends, we'll get further advice on the subject. But actually, we have inside of ourselves a mind that does not become healthy unless it is exercised. And exercise is use. Exercise is not sitting and watching. Exercise is not reading. Exercise is think thinking. Thinking with the faculties that we possess and which we are supposed to enrich every day of our lives. Everything that happens to us has some kind of meaning, but we accept it through the ears or the eyes and it fades away. The mind is not involved in the process of personal growth in most cases. We use the mind only as a computer or as a machine, never as a creative thinking equipment. So somewhere in along this line we have to face what we might term a gradual deterioration of the mental powers within ourselves. And this deterioration is very obvious in society as we know it today. We are not doing as good a job of living, thinking, acting as our ancestors did. We have created a situation in which thoughts are liable to destroy us rather than protect us. And in the face of this, we settle back to a daily routine in which the growth of our own inner life is very much weakened. When we get a man's working for an Olympic gold, we find him exercising every day, and the result of his exercise is that his body becomes more and more an instrument of his purposes. He gains control of himself. A person whose mind is being used every day to find new values, do new things that have not been done, improve the quality of living, solve the personal problems of his life. These are the things that help to exercise the mind. The creative thinker is a person seldom seen or met. We come into a world in which most of the elements necessary for health integration are already polluted before they are built into our own organism. We breathe in pollution with the first breath of life. We find pollution present in the body of the mother, pollution that cannot be entirely avoided. The parent has to live upon the food products, upon the environmental pressures of the world. Thus we come into a physical world that is full of problems, and we come into a physical body that is full of problems. We have therefore not only to fight against the pressures of many forces around us that we do not admire, but we are required to adjust to the conditioning influence of these processes within ourselves. To meet this situation, the modern uh, thinking has developed a number of concepts of nutrition, but by the time we grow up to the point where before even the years of majority, we have already inhaled the problems of humanity. Even the light of the sun is not coming to us in its best possible form. We know that the basic discomforts of the body result in discomfort of thought and feeling. 
In other words, the human being in the body is not comfortable. And even if the basic instincts and intuition do come from within the individual, they must pass through a partly corrupted body in order to come into manifestation. And as a result of this, the body itself is unable to provide an appropriate environment for consciousness or for the higher ideals of human nature. Corruption always lowers thresholds. It always makes things less than they should be. It distorts. And we sort of feel that these distortions are the real self, and they are not. So getting in is not easy. Getting out is not easy. And being here is not easy. The individual does the best he can considering the conditions in which he exists. And these conditions, unfortunately, are also operating inside of it. Also, we realize that world psychological pressures are continuously afflicting the best parts of ourselves. They are continually preventing us from manifesting the reality that we would like to know and understand. The ancients, therefore, gave us the concept that the body is the living temple of the living God. Each human body is a sanctuary for a spiritual entity or reality. This body, this temple, has been in various ways corrupted. More intelligently viewed, more carefully considered, this temple, which has become a place of merchandise, is also within ourselves. Most folks do not even bother to consider the body a temple. In the first place, to most individuals, the body is merely a servant of the purposes of the will, the mind, and the emotion. The body is merely a kind of animal which is supposed to draw wagons as horses did. Nature wants the individual to grow. Nature has provided an environment suitable for growth, and the human being has gradually, over a long period of time, compromised his principles and in so doing has adversely conditioned the world in which he lives. So here we are as persons inhabiting two environments, the larger environment of the world and the smaller environment of our own body. Now the physical body has laws. Everything in the universe is ruled by law. And the laws of the physical body are very simple. The law is that the body is the instrument by means of which the individual is able to exist in this material world. Without the body is a vaporous abstraction. Now we have in the world what we might call the good life. Now this good life is very largely lived at the expense of health. It is a means of indulgence of appetite. Going a little further into this situation, we come upon natural protection by which the body seek to restore itself. These mechanisms to function, however, must be given the cooperation of the person inhabiting it. Actually, it is impossible for a body governed by natural law to work in harmony with a mind or emotion that is, a viol that is violating natural law. The body needs proper environment, and in our present intense scientific industrialism, the body of the individual is sacrificed to external factors that are themselves not necessarily valid. If we live in a world in which most of human activity is devoted to a single purpose, and that is economic maintenance, the body is going to be one of the primary victims. It is not intended to work deep under the earth, hour after hour, year after year. It is not intended to be locked into an industrial situation in which there is no incentive for the development of the person in the body. This person becomes merely a servant of, an, of a world economic institution, and as a result of that, in turn, the body suffers and gradually falls into a variety of infirmities. This industry takes the person away from the natural habits of life. He is gradually being locked into a kind of life that is now governed largely by computerization. And all this means sickness. It means trouble. It means that the individual has not recognized the true nature of his own instruction. This body is his house. It is his duty to keep this house as best he can and to gradually realize that it is not his own house alone. It is the house of the divine power which manifests through it. To keep this house 
is therefore not merely a physical responsibility, it is a spiritual responsibility. Because if it is allowed to fall into disorder, that part of man which is the important part, the part which is tied to the universe and tied to the divine plan of things, is forbidden natural expression. When the inner life becomes disturbed, it reacts upon the body, lowering resistance. In the Asclepian dialogue, Hermes describes the fact that in a sense these buildings were memorials to the divine power. They bore witness to those times and those thoughts when the gods walked with men. They became part of a traditional heritage. The gods who walked with men were actually the gods in men that it was a divine level of insight which resulted in the great architectural feedback which we know as the pyramids. The circumstances around them challenge our imagination. We know that whoever built the great pyramid of Giza was well acquainted with astronomy, that he had a very complete knowledge of the solar system and all of the wonders of the cosmic plan as revealed through the bodies and objects moving in the heavens. He knew the distances between the earth and the other planets of the solar system. He knew the precession of the equinoxes. He realized the importance of the star groups. He already knew the decans and dodecanates of the zodiac. The only possible answer is that at the time the pyramid builders labored, they had a knowledge among themselves that had not been distributed to the people. Even the rulers did not possess this knowledge. And that there was a cult or sect of architects and artificers who knew the proportions and mathematics. Also, they require a skill and a group of instrumental aids, which we do not believe that antiquity possessed. We know that the Egyptians and other nations of that period were esotericists. We know that they had a knowledge of natural law far ahead of their time. These people had a deep appreciation for the immensity and integrity of the universal plan. They had never developed that strange type of egotism which impels us often to assume that God is depending upon us to take care of his purposes and plans. They did not think this. One thing is probably inevitable, that whoever built the pyramid had a very great knowledge. One thing that comes to mind then in connection with this whole situation is that we may have to revise our understanding of what antiquity was like. Somewhere along the way there were tremendous minds, a great body of knowledge that was capable of planning and executing unbelievable works of skill, beauty, and wisdom. The uh, Egyptians themselves were of the opinion that at a remote time the gods had been with men, that deities and divine powers walked the earth. Perhaps what they were trying to tell us is that in a remote time long ago, the human being was naturally mystical, naturally had the power of extrasensory perception naturally could communicate or understand, estimate, or react to the divine principles upon which the universe was based. That the, really, the, the gods walking with men merely meant that the god power in man was not obscured as it is now. That gradually, over a course of time, the material world has taken over. This depth of insight has been lost as the result of the individual being subjected to continual external conditioning. As a result of that, he has lost the power of direct contact with realities. There was undoubtedly a tradition that descended into Egypt from a still earlier source, a tradition based upon an internal development of spiritual resources by four or five thousand or even ten thousand BC uh, there was a great knowledge in the hands or in the keeping of a few persons and these few persons more or less set up the system of mysteries which operated in Egypt, Greece and the Roman Empire. The initiate system which was the prevailing system in Egypt at that time was based upon one tremendous point 
The purposes of the mysteries, according to such initiates as Plotinus, Procrus, Iamblichus, Ammonius, Saccus, and others, was that the individual should learn factually, truly, beyond question, beyond doubt, through personal experience, that death is an illusion. Immortality is the summit of man's problem. The ancients not only believed in it, but kept this belief in secret, but developed a science by means of which they could communicate the fact and example and circumstance of death directly to another person. In other words, the initiates of the mysteries were persons who had lived, died, and been born again in this world. In order to accomplish this, there was an elaborate ritual system. Thus, in the mystery system, there was no one converting people to this. There was no one preaching it or teaching it. In the mysteries, the candidate went through it himself. He went into the realm of death and returned again. Now, we don't realize, perhaps, how important this point would be in the modeling of civilization. We do not realize how oppressive the concept of death is. The main point was to establish the reality of survival and its associate belief, the consciousness or concept of rebirth. Rebirth was simply immortality, spaced out. It was a part of the everlasting, ever-livingness of everything that exists. The ancients, therefore, had very little fear of death. There was something about it all that transformed a life of fear into a life of certainty. It also removed the dynamic importance of material existence. This uh, initiation rite was undoubtedly sustained by the use of esoteric skills and powers that we know very little about at the present time. Birth physically was the human being coming out of the womb into a body, and that this body itself became the womb of the second birth. For the individual retaining enlightenment transcended the limitation of body, and those who did not achieve this were born out of body into an unembodied state at the end of life. Another interesting example of this particular type of thought is to be found in Judo. Uh, judo and many other of the self-defensive arts of the Orient are concerned with a peculiar kind of courage, a courage which must be completely free from anxiety and fear. If the fear exists, the individual is weakened by the rise of a terror within himself and therefore usually comes to disaster in his own day and in his own way. So in Judo, before the artist achieves the highest grades of the art, he must be killed. His teacher kills him. His teacher performs certain structural pressures upon the body that stop the heart, and the heart is allowed to be stopped for a certain number of seconds, from early one or two minutes. Then the master resuscitates the disciple by pressure upon other parts of the body. And in this case, the person who has been killed lives again, remembers and knows what happened to him, and realizes that his fear of death was ungrounded, that the fear of transition, which might make him a coward in this world, was a, a, simply an illusion of his own mind that actually transition was just as normal, natural, and reasonable as any other aspect of life, and that there was no interruption. The individual never ceased to be an immortal being, whether in body or out of it. Ancient philosophy and science derived a great deal of symbolical knowledge and insight from the study of the human body. For it was long held that if we could ever understand man, we would have a key to all things that exist, inasmuch as man is bound to all other things. He moves through all states and conditions and finds available within himself all instruments necessary for his continuing existence 
growth and unfoldment through all the states of nature, both physical and metaphysical. Thus our concepts of cosmogony are studies of things not visible to our sensory perceptions. These involve a process of analogy by which we apply things seen to things unseen. The Kabbalists conceived of man, therefore, as the little universe, and the universe as the grand man, and that all space can be traced in the mysteries of man himself. It is natural that the spine should be early considered, that a great deal of symbolism should arise in connection with it, and it was interesting to recognize that this tall column of bones should support upon its upper end the mystery of the skull, and of this mysterious upper world. The number of its original segments, counting those which are now more or less uh, brought together and ossified together, uh, would be 33, which is indeed the number of years that David ruled in Jerusalem, the years of the life of Christ, and a number that has been sacred for a long time among the secret societies of Europe and America. The spine became a symbolic equivalent of this number and the principles and energies associated with the number. It was held that it was like a column, the roots of which were in the underworld, and the upper part extending higher to carry upon its upper end the celestial globe. Thus the ancients divided man as they divided nature into heaven, earth, and hell, into three great parts, a superior universe above represented by the brain, an inferior universe below represented by the abdominal cavity, and between these two the world of mortals, or the human world, in the midst of which upon the mighty mountain of the diaphragm was the temple of the heart. It is in the heart that he participates of universal consciousness. From the heart center he gains the concept or the authority of life. It is by virtue of this heart power that man is aware of the mystery of what he calls life. The brain he has associated with thought or the mental activity and the venous system of the body he has associated with function or bodily structure. Man, therefore, consisting of spirit, soul, and body, or spirit, mind, and body, assigns these in a symbolic way to these three great areas of his own physical structure, which are united into one mysterious and wonderful pattern by the nervous system. The entire nervous system of the body is an extension of the nervous structure of the brain itself. The ancients, therefore, explain that there was a microcosm of the whole physical body in the brain. Now the answer to all mysteries lies in the heart. The power to search for this answer is given by the mind. Life is conveyed to all parts of the body by the arteries. But this life was a sleeping life, a life which contained all energy, all that was necessary to enliven. But this sleeping life did not know itself or any other thing. The mental nature began to exercise control, domination, or leadership by permeating this life with a series or a mass of minute extensions which gradually became nerves. But these nerves are nothing more or less than the gradual crystallization of the seeking power of the mind. That the mind could control the body meant self-control. We find that the nervous system has permeated practically all parts of human structure that as a result of this, this structure is becoming increasingly sensitive and immediately responsive. Therefore, mind must have its place in the universal purpose, or it could not appear in the human structure. About the second century of the Christian era in Asia, there arose a sect in Buddhism which was centered around what was called the Lotus Gospel, centered around what was called the heart doctrine, the fact that the truth of things must be obtained by restoring the sovereignty of life to the heart, that the real person, the real nature of things, resides in the heart, that the heart is therefore the silent one, that power which is generally ignored, 
but which alone contains the fountain of things. By means of the heart we are bound to the world of cause. By means of the nerves and the mind we are bound to the world of effects. And at the moment in some way the truth in us is concealed by the conflict between these two systems. And here is where we get into perhaps one of the most interesting but complicated uh, doctrines of antiquity, and that is this doctrine of the Kundalini Shakti and the spinal chakras. Let us then try to understand this a little better. Now most of you have read something concerning uh, the yogic ideas about the spinal chakras, that through these there moves a mysterious power which is called the serpent power. And that this power, rising from the base of the spine, ascending through the various small nervous threads of the autonomic system, results in the activation of these chakras. And that by the activation of these chakras, certain internal areas of consciousness are opened or are intensified. In almost all works, in fact all works, dealing with the chakras, these are represented in one way or another by symbolic figures. These figures are for the most part lotus form, distinguished by the number of petals. Each of these lotus forms carries within it certain other images and symbols. Thus the key to the opening of the chakras consists of a series of meditations. The chakras are actually all of them in the brain, and that what we call the spinal chakras are the reflexes of the brain chakras in the mirror of mind. The chakras themselves are in the seven primary caves of the brain. Why do the Tantras say this? Why? For a very simple re reason, namely that the entire chakra concept is mental. The purpose that he is attempting to achieve is therefore the intimate, immediate realization of the life power of the heart. Regardless of the times in which we live, the journey of the human soul remains the most important consideration in the life of the individual and should be one of the great dynamics of the life of the collective. Until the human being senses again, until he realizes that his destiny is not fulfilled in the small cycle of immediate experiences with which he is familiar. The individual today has lost his kinship with a group of values which ancient man fully appreciated and accepted. He saw himself as part of a vast living organism. The ancient man, therefore, looking around and seeing the universe, saw it as a vast house, as a house in which there were many rooms. Man saw the universe as a vast structure of evolving life and saw himself moving through this structure. Where did man come from? Man came out of a universal state. He came from the everywhere into the here. The ancient man believed that in a remote period men lived with the gods, that men were fashioned first in a strange heavenly state, and then he started forth on his journey, and as man descended into the great ring of Saturn, according to the ancients, he received the potential of abstract mind, the power to become fruit. He did not become a fruit, he merely gained the power to be. And as he descended beyond this into the sphere of, of Jupiter, another vestment was added over as a garment upon an undergarment. A man gained the potential power of being reasonable, the power to think things through, to philosophize, and to gain 
actual attribute of judgment. Then he went still further down and he received another vestment. And this third vestment was bestowed by the spirit of Mars. And this was the vestment of courage. The individual gained the power to become brave. To stand under the struggle and stress of things. To bear pain. To have the courage to dare added to the wisdom to be silent, which he had previously received. Then he went still further and another luminous vestment was imposed upon him, and he was surrounded with a halo of light. He gained for himself the power of vitality, the power of energy. Energy becomes necessary to courage, and his light came from the sun. And from the sun he passed on downward still further, and he received from the guardian of the gate of Venus. He gained the mysterious power of beauty. He gained the ability to love, the strange and wonderful ability to forget self in the service of the beloved. And then he went still further downward into the mystery of things, and he came to the orbit of Mercury. And here was given to him skill and cunning and the ability to use his hands and to fashion and to fabricate things. And he was also given quickness. Wit was bestowed so that he might bear the rest with patience. And then he came down into the orbit of the moon and here imagination was bestowed. And imagination was the power it was some time to break all the bounds and boundaries that held him, and to give him freedom and release into a larger life. And thus well covered with seven rings, one within another, until he was burdened and loaded and heavy. He was then, according to the Greeks, caused to fall downward into darkness, into the mystery of the sphere of generation, which is the earth. And here then he was born, born with the seven vestments within himself, hidden from all sight, contained within and behind this thing which we call the body, given to the soul by the stars, in order that the soul might find its way back home again. Little by little these potentials and powers which he has close in upon him again. His prudence becomes over-caution and finally fearfulness. His judgment becomes locked by crystallization into intolerance, into opinion, or perhaps is not well enough developed to give him the power to judge righteous judgment. His courage leads him to disaster. He becomes not brave but audacious, and in such allows his ambitions to pervert his principles. His energy he wastes in riotous living. We waste our energies and then sometime wish we had them. Imagination leads us into every fantasy and excess, into suspicion, into tyranny, despotism, into all kinds of terror in the night. So one by one, these powers of the soul which should give us the full measure of realization, betray us and leave us victim. But the rescuing of this was by the long process of outgrowing conditioned existence. And to achieve this end, the soul had to consciously ascend through the seven orbits of the stars, from the dark threshold of the moon god, up through the seven gates to the upper world from which he had come. The journey back upward is always man's eternal psychic entity leading him back by his dreams, his aspirations, and his affections to the great spheres from which he fell. To seek adventure, to seek things, and in gaining things, to lose self. But man gaining all other things has, as a result, lost pure consciousness, without which his journey to light cannot be perfected. To escape from the world, he must therefore escape from worldliness, 
which had to either be overcome or man would be drawn back. Therefore he turned as the mystic turned. Instead of attempting to conquer the world, he attempted to conquer worldliness in himself, realizing that he was bound here by these very ambitions which he sought to satisfy or to gratify, consequently by becoming desireless, by no longer responding to the allurements of the world, by no longer admitting the power of the world, that instead of dying out of a material state, he must die out of the materiality in himself.